I bet you weren't expecting this one. Unless you guessed my clues. Yeah, the original plan for A Bit More Jordan was to provide you with insight into some of my favorite games of all time. Some really popular ones like Skies of Arcadia or some cult classics like Alundra. This is none of them. But I saw that Obi-Wan got a brand new TV show a few weeks back and suddenly there was this massive tidal wave of a returning memory from my youth. Now I frigging love Star Wars. As a kid, if it wasn't Three Kingdoms, it was Star Wars. Love it. I love playing Star Wars video games. I had so many as a kid. Shadows of the Empire, Knights of the Old Republic, Rogue Squadron, the classics that just allowed me to get into this universe I loved so much. There was one game, however, that my dad bought, a licensed tie-in to the brand new movie, The Return of Star Wars, with Episode 1, The Phantom Menace. I remember this game in the loosest possible sense. I have two memories. Firstly, the opening scene, and secondly, trying to offer Republican credits to everyone and no bugger accepting them. Literally, that's all I remember, but those two slithers of memories are quite fun. Ah, remember that time when they wouldn't take Republican credits again and again? What memories? Firstly, the movie itself, a bit of background. Phantom Menace is widely derided these days, probably even back then, but I was like 10 and everything that was Star Wars was awesome and nobody told me otherwise. And I've had a roller coaster of emotions with it. You know, I enjoyed episode one as a kid. I laughed at it when I found Red Letter Media and they pointed out the many, many flaws with it. And then the nostalgia came back. It's actually not that bad. It is a mess of a movie, but for me, it's just a fun, schlocky adventure, at least in my opinion. I am old enough to admit I quite like it. It is not great, but it's fine. It's fine for me. So what's better than watching a two hour movie of something I like when you can stretch that bad boy out into an eight hour video game? Because that's basically what we have here. The PlayStation and PC release of Star Wars Episode 1 The Phantom Menace is a beat for beat game of the movie but stretched out to a $40 price point. How is that possible? You can't just smash droids with lightsabers for eight hours, can you? Well, that's what we're going to find out. Is this game as terrible as everyone makes it out to be? A massive thank you to my Patreon supporters who kindly help me make this video for you guys. Yes, I know it's not much compared to some other YouTube channels out there, but this is only the second video. And yes, I'm just forever grateful that you are willing to support me in my dream to become a full-time content creator. I really would like to do that. If you want to join them and get these videos earlier, like a little bit earlier, then click the link in the description. We also have bonus content. Yes, uh, that will be public at some point. But for now, there is a small bonus episode for our Patreon, our, my Patreon supporters. Yes, and this week's bonus video is about a Game Boy game, basically the a Game Boy conversion of this game called Obi-Wan's Adventures. That should be up on Patreon very soon. Click the link in the description if you want to support me. So back to the topic at hand, Star Wars Episode 1, The Phantom Menace. If we're going to overanalyze this, we have to stop a moment and take a gander at the main menu. Something that will definitely catch your eye is the music video. <laughs> what? That is probably the last option I thought I'd see in a Star Wars PS1 game. Are you going to get some Euro beats of the late 90s? Doesn't seem like the most Star Wars-y thing. And obviously every single one of you will click this first. There's no question about that. You will not be able to resist a Star Wars music video. Okay, yeah, this is a bit rubbish. Come on, John, liven this up. Sorry, sorry, I need to take things into my own hands. Yeah, that's better. Okay, enough of that. I guess someone was taking an editing course and wanted to show off their skills. Let's get into the game. This is pretty much the movie straight up. So if you watch the movie, which considering it made a billion dollars in revenue, a lot of you have. I might be wasting your time, but frankly, if you've clicked on a video that's an hour long, you've got time to spare. Turn on the subtitles, start the game, and you'll be greeted with Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon waiting in the waiting room. A familiar sight. Qui-Gon suggests that something may be wrong. He tells you to look out of the window to witness troop transporters heading to Naboo. Well, I would if I wasn't looking over the edge of the fucking universe. Jesus, what the hell is this camera? It's the viewpoint I like to call peering down the back of a sofa looking for your kid's lost toy. I'm getting a crimp neck just looking at this thing. It's going to take a bit of getting used to. 
Also, who the hell is this? One, but don't let them cloud your judgment. Who's saying this? That is definitely not Liam Neeson. It's someone pretending to be Liam Neeson if they're talking from the side of their mouth. You can head over to the droid and ask them either A, where the trade leaders are, or B, why the frig is there gas pouring into the room? Just have a casual convo, why don't you? Fortunately, Qui-Gon is alert enough to tell you to get out of here. In retaliation, I'd just like to mince this droid. What a knob. You don't have much time to get used to the controls here as you're thrown straight into a group of matchstick droids. You can swipe with your lightsaber to take them down, or you can hold down the button, which will act defensively, parrying their lasers back at them. It's not a given though, and you're going to be taking plenty of hits, which will give you a taste for how unforgiving this game can be. The movie might be for kids, but the game certainly is not. There's a sense of urgency as you try to escape. There's immediately a three-point junction here. Obviously, you know straight ahead is the real way to go, but it's definitely a nice choice to go both left and right, get used to the controls, see what kind of things are interactive or not, go press a few buttons, murder some innocent droids, pick up a blaster if you're feeling uncivilized, and a thermal detonator if you're feeling super uncivilized. You may also press some of the terminals to see that one of the workers here has a bit of a stalker level boner for Queen Amidala. That's totally not creepy, she's 14 years old. This is a game that does reward exploration, but it also can punish you as well. As we come to the next junction, there are two ways to go, the right way or the death way. If you turn this way, you'll be greeted by these deadly roller droids, whatever they're called. It's an unnecessary risk at this point. Turning the correct way, you have to open up another door by pressing a few switches and killing a few droids. You'll notice that there is a secret door of sorts that you can't seem to find a switch for. Well, despite what the critics said at the time, I think it's quite clever because if you go back to the R2 unit you may or may not have destroyed, uh, I did, you can coax it into following you into that area to open up the secret door. And seriously, for all this game's flaws, which will be highlighted, I think there is a sense of nuance to many aspects of it, and this is just one of them. Sure, you could have murdered the droid, and let's face it, if you're a monster, you probably did. But if you didn't, you can get a bonus that's not entirely obvious. There are so many small touches to this game that makes me feel like it was a little bit ahead of its time. I'm sure I'll point out many of those along the way. But first, oh sugar, that is a lot of roller droids and you're going to leg it. Unfortunately, you can't run as fast as they can in the movies. Here it's more of a mild jog to the bathroom. Well, you're kind of in a rush, but you don't want people to know that you're desperate for a piss. After running down a tunnel, you'll fall into a grate while you'll end up separated from Obi-Wan. So sadly, he can't take the laser blast for you right now. This will be a running theme. You'll be in a small maze-like environment, ventilation shafts. It's small, cramped, and full of cleaner droids who are conveniently ready to electrocute you, as though they know you're an unwanted Jedi. Here it's best to get used to that blaster as it's seriously better to deal with them from afar. In fact, blasters in this game make lightsabers look like baby toys. They are so much more useful. After a small switch puzzle thing, you'll witness your ship blowing up, which is a rather nice cinematic touch for the time. They didn't need to show this. If I remember rightly in the movie, it was a cutaway shot, but here it's environmental storytelling done well. It's something that you can't miss. There's no danger. You're just high up on this vantage point and you see your only method of escape getting blown to bits. If you look closely, you can see the severed arm of a pilot. Not really. You have another fork in the road now, something which this game loves. Usually one is death, the other probable death. Because this game can be really tough. I wouldn't say I've been super careful, but so far I've died four times at this point, and I've just died again due to no health replenishments. Hmm, I might have to start the level again. Thankfully, the developers probably realized this was going to be a hard game, so implemented a save any time policy, which I don't know how common that was at the time, especially for console games, but I don't believe it was a widespread thing. Personally, I don't enjoy cheesing my way through games, so I don't save before every jump or battle, but it's nice to make your own checkpoints from time to time, because there are no checkpoints here. Why is it so difficult? Well, it's a mixture of a few things. While the camera doesn't help the situation, it's certainly not the main culprit. Sure, enemies do cheese you by shooting at you before you can even see them. But also, the game utilizes tank controls. You press forward, you walk forward. You press right, your character will turn right along with the camera. You can't walk around with an analog scheme, and facing enemies at the right time can be really fiddly, especially when enemies are at tight angles from you. As you can see, I know the enemy is there, but as soon as I awkwardly try to maneuver my way to get my attack in, they will always be ready to fire. You're immediately at a disadvantage. 
There is this cool dodge roll that you can do that made me feel more like Max Payne than Obi-Wan, but hey, I'll take it. I did feel badass doing this. Who needs lightsabers when you can blast them from afar? Avoiding enemy fire is difficult. It doesn't matter if your lightsaber skills are good or not, you're gonna take pot shots. It's also not afraid to just mess with you with deliberate traps or tough numerous enemies that no matter what you do, you are up against it. And of course, the jumping is the ass of all assiers kinds. All of this culminates in a very difficult game, one that is most certainly not for kids. How I got further in this game as a child, I have no recollection. Probably thanks to my dad, maybe I used action replay, literally no idea. It is really hard. At this point you'll bump into your first non-robotic NPC, one of the Trade Federation dudes who will give you a bit of info if you interrogate him. Now you can either just move on with the mission by destroying this machine, or you can murder him if you want, up to you. Yes, in this game you can go full GTA. You can murder pretty much everyone if you feel like it. How this slipped past LucasArts back in the day remains a mystery, but this was probably the most unique aspect of this game. A good old Jedi massacring people. And the people will actually react to you. They become scared of you. Who are you gonna murder next, mister? They start to make comments about your deeds. It's just hilarious and adds a really unexpected layer to the game. This had dark side mechanics before Knights of the Old Republic existed, but even more hardcore. Anyways, you'll make your way to the hangar and absolutely bob yourself when this giant robot pops up like a spooked spider. Thankfully, if you're quick enough, you can just avoid him altogether. You'll then come to a windy path high above the hangar where you'll see Qui-Gon who tells you to get aboard one of the transporter ships heading to Naboo. Here, you'll have a small environmental puzzle pressing switches to move things, let a lift come towards you. The final push is two gangs of droids. Sprint past the first one, try not to fall off the edge of the second one, and you're good to go. Congratulations, after 20 deaths you are now on level 2, which I'm sure you've all guessed is the swamps of Naboo. This was just like a quick one minute scene in the movie from what I remember, but now it's a full level because value for money and all that. Immediately you can see the issue here, or maybe it's what you can't see. You have this massive wide open space, and what are you looking at? Your feet. Yeah, you can see jack shit. You're a bit nervous about advancing or even exploring. The previous level taught you that exploration can be rewarded but is also dangerous. So instead of going straight forward, you're gonna go everywhere but straight ahead. But uh, yeah. There's nothing here apart from massive laser blast. Jesus, I know it's a war zone but you know, give me a breather, yeah? This is a surprisingly large level, or at least it feels like it since you can't actually look forward to see it. It's very maze-like with lots of platforming sections. In fact, it does a good job of being a little open-ended since there are multiple paths you can take which you probably won't even know about. Usually in games when there's multiple routes to go on a level, the game is kind enough to signpost them. I hate that because it drives my indecision nuts. My anxiety kicks in about missing something, so much so that I'll end up going down a little bit of one route, like picking something up, coming back, and then going down a little bit of the other route, and then back in the... Maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm just being weird, but that's how I roll. I like the fact that I'll stumble into one route without ever knowing there may be another way to go, unless I play through a second time and experiment. You'll come across me a bit racist, if you're one of those people. Jar Jar, who I assume you can massacre, but I'd rather not have to restart the level just yet. And it seems like it's the real voice actor this time. Not Misa, out of this. The level almost feels like Tomb Raider at this point. There's the aesthetic of course, but you'll be jumping, pushing blocks, hanging onto vines and ledges. You'll almost forget you're playing a Star Wars game, at least up until the thousand droids start blasting lasers at you from nowhere. Also, holding an open lightsaber while shimmying across a vine, that, that is ballsy. It seems like you're almost there with Jar Jar taking you to Qui-Gon, maybe. Who knows what the friggy said. You'll come to this point, there's a huge amount of attack droids up ahead and uh, you're thinking, okay, so how can we sneak past these guys without having to fight them because there's obviously no chance, uh, uh, Jar Jar? Jar Jar? What are you doing, man? What? Jesus, what the f- I mean, Star Wars has had its share of epic deaths. I mean, you know, Palpatine getting thrown down that big tube. What do you mean he's not dead? Darth Maul getting cut in half? What do you mean he's not- That A-Wing fighter who took down a whole Star Destroyer, you can't tell me he's not fucking dead. Maybe. I'm not sure now. No one's ever really gone. But this, this is right up there. I mean, just look at that swag rocking up like he's 50 cent. He's definitely a few cents short of a buck, we all know that. And he's taking more bullets as well. 
Oh, oh wait, he's not dead. Plot armor. He's the perfect distraction while I take out the droids. Oh, he, he's actually dead. That was pretty badass though. What a trooper. If he actually did go out like that in the movie, I think the movie would have been an all-time classic and Jar Jar would have been considered a hero. Well, better restart. Okay, now I'm not going to let that amphibian sacrifice himself this time. I'm charging in with a couple of grenades. It's going well. I'm battling away. One of those crates is destroyed. I wonder if there's a health to go up. You. You snidey. Let's try again. Be a bit more careful this time. Actually, not too bad. Oh. What? What's this? Never mind, I completed the level. The third level, we end up down in Gunga, or whatever the place is called. You seek a meeting with Boss Nas to warn them about the current invasion by the Trade Federation. You also want to warn the Queen of Naboo, as though she may not have noticed the thousands of attack ships descending into the airspace. This is where you're introduced to a slightly different kind of gameplay. This is more of an adventure style stuff. Kinda, it's a halfway point. By the way, I do find it quite funny that the Gungans have these little aquariums in the city, as though the giant depths of the sea outside the window just isn't enough. Now if you watch the movie, you know that Jar Jar was banished from the city for being a clumsy idiot, and during his return, he is arrested. But clever Qui-Gon, feeling rather compassionate, helps him out by claiming that Jar Jar owes him a life debt and must be spared, which Boss Nas agrees to. Now that would be a rubbish level if that happened here. So what can we do? Well. Jar Jar is going to get executed. Bit grim. And as Obi-Wan, you've got to bust that mother out. Yes, it's time for another heist, this time for an annoying racist amphibian. Qui-Gon, well, he's just going to wait for you. Here you'll explore a bit of the Gungan city more, which is nice. I always wanted to spend more time here when it was in the movie, even if it is linear. And it's the kind of level that allows you to be either evil or a slightly good person. Qui-Gon tells you to do it peacefully, and once you're in the actual dungeon sort of place, you can either slaughter the entire population with little to no consequence, or try to do it peacefully. While I think most of us would try to do it peacefully, the game tries to make that as hard as possible for you, since, well, firstly, these little shits will randomly call you ugly, a murderer. I didn't kill anyone! Yet. Still time, sunshine. And also, randomly, some of the guards will attack you. I don't know if this level is a buggy mess, because most won't attack you. Some will, even when unprovoked. He feels a bit messy about the overall message the game is trying to give here. It acts as though you are evil, even if you really didn't do anything. I mean, seriously, I played this level without hurting anyone. You can get by easy just by using your force powers to push them away. And a new technique introduced into this level, the power of persuasion. If text is highlighted purple, it means it's a persuasive technique. You know the one. These are not the droids you're looking for. Yes, you can be the best gaslighter in history, which is better than murdering them, but that wouldn't hold up in a sexual harassment court case, I would think. Anyways, you could just murder them if you want, bust him out. Not sure how Boss Nas would react to that. Probably less willing to help you out during the finale. It's up to you. It's a pretty relaxing level in all honesty. There's a mild mix of puzzle solving, platforming and simple action. Compared to the previous two levels and the one that's about to come up, it's a nice change of pace. Sadly, that relaxing style does not last long. There's only so many copy and paste rooms that can happen before the developers, you know, need to move on. And moving on we are, apparently through the entire core of the planet, somehow avoiding complete incineration. We end up in the Garden of Feed, a grand palace for the Queen. As soon as the level begins, good old Qui-Gon and Jar Jar get separated after a bridge gets blasted by a big tank. I'm pretty sure Qui-Gon is just using that as an excuse to sit on his ass for the level. Wouldn't be the first or last time. Now this level is a lot more bright and colourful than the previous three. You'll almost be squinting at this point due to the drastic change. You should be quite used to the awkward double jump at this point, and you'll make your way over pillars, swimming through water until you come across a jump that appears to be a few centimetres out of your reach. Well, if you step back and actually look instead of jumping straight away like the idiot I am, then you'll see there's a switch on the other side. Whip out your blaster, shoot the switch, and hey presto, you got yourself a new game mechanic. The devs just did a high five in the office when they thought of this mechanic. This is a really brutal level. I highly advise safe scumming because if you don't, you're going to get quite frustrated. Levels in this game are long and unforgiving. 
I do like the fact that you'll come across Naboo forces trying to fight off the droid army. They are quite useless, but I do enjoy games where NPCs feel like they're also contributing to a battle, like you're in this together. Other people playing their part for the greater good. You're not alone in this. Games like the early Dynasty Warriors games, Saving Private Ryan, I mean Medal of Honor Frontline, Halo, when the grunts are by your side and it's not like 100% scripted, maybe they'll survive, maybe they'll die, knowing that makes me want to fight even harder. I genuinely enjoy it when games do that. It adds unpredictability. It may even add replayability for some. As someone who considers myself an underdog, I root for the NPCs who aren't the super overpowered main character. I want to see them do well and survive and maybe even accomplish something themselves. If you speak to them, they may even help you, like definitely speak to this dude and get an awesome blaster which is very much needed for the absolute marathon of droids lurking around the corners. So yeah, moving on, you'll come across a coincidentally maze-like garden that's full of droids and even more menacing things. Seriously, save before you do this bit because you're probably gonna die. A lot. There's very little cover and getting your angles correct for taking down these droids is not easy. I found a very special technique that I like to call cheesing it. Yeah, you can jump just slightly over the walls and take pot shots at the droids and I can't imagine doing this level any other way. I guess you could do your best action hero impression or try your best deflecting their blasters with your lightsaber. Neither works particularly well so uh, yeah, just cheese it. You'll come across a massive tank again but my sound advice is friggin leg it until you actually get to the tank that you have to face. Yes, there is a boss to this level, a giant tank guarding the exit. I lobbed a couple of grenades, did a bit of cheesing, until finally he seemed to stop moving, which of course, all's fair in Love and War, I took full advantage of it, nearly killing myself in the process. How this was supposed to be a fair fight looks to be genuinely bad design. Usually bosses have gimmicks or safe techniques to take them down, not just popping out once in a while and hoping not to get blasted. Well, more on that in a second. That's not the end of the level, however, because the gate is still there, which, in my moments of panic with the boss, I did spy this switch over here. Now that boss is dead, I can easily just shoot it to open the gate, but uh, that doesn't seem like it's it. There's two gates. One is open, one is not. That must mean there are two switches, yes? Yes, I'm clever. So looking around, you may see this window that's open. Ooh, secret maybe. No, it's just a bonus room where you find full health. Perfect. But still no signs of a switch. Time to go further afar to find... Hey, look, another window. What's in this one? A bomb. Well, that would have been nice to deal with the tank. And what's that down on the balcony? It's a rocket launcher. That would have been super handy to deal with the tank. If only I'd have taken a different turn on the way to the boss. Never mind. Hitting the button opens up another door above. Shimmying across to that, what do you get? Another rocket launcher. So instead of taking 10 minutes having pot shots at the boss, I could have taken him out in 10 seconds. This game likes to reward exploration. Although it would have been nice if these windows could have been in view while rocking up to the boss, not only when backtracking. But still, where is that goddamn switch? I'm starting to get a little annoyed at this point, even backtracking quite a bit to see if there's anything I'd missed. But no, the only interesting thing I did discover is that sprinting against the wall at a certain angle supercharges your speed. That's one for you speedrunners. Well, they probably know that already. Tried. Eventually, I'm just pissed off. I start jumping around like an idiot. And, lo and behold, way high up in a place you're not even able to see, not even with a hint, the holy final switch. That is bad design. There's also a mysterious door. I have no idea what it's for, plus some hint on the wall with a circled image, which is nice. If it wasn't pixelated to oblivion, God knows what that's supposed to show. Anyways, finally, the level is done, and good old Qui-Gon is there to meet you with the Queen and her guards. The plan is to head to Coruscant, to the Senate, to plead for help. A solid plan is planned. To escape via the Queen's ship, let's head to the hangar together. We're cut off! Look, I know they can't have a badass Jedi help you all of the time, but would it be possible, would it be possible to think of a different excuse? 
We're on the fifth level, and this is the fourth time they've been cut off from each other. The only time they weren't is when Qui-Gon didn't want to get off his ass to bust Jar Jar out of jail. That's legitimately a better excuse. Seriously, if he whipped out his roll-up cigarette kit and just waved you on saying, I'll meet you there, that would have been better. And I know I keep saying it, but the game just keeps on getting tougher. If you think escort missions are a pain in the ass, even in modern gaming, imagine one on the PS1 on a licensed tie-in. Yes, you have to guide the practically suicidal Amidala to the hangar through tight streets with heavy enemy presence. It is really tough. Looking after yourself is hard enough. Once again, you can be a good Jedi if you want to. There's a couple of side quests within this mission, as though you're not rushed enough. This little boy wants to return to his mama, and this troop's got a broken leg and wants some water. As you do, broken bones always parch the lips. You'll get some small rewards for doing these, the health being the best of the lot. Tactically telling Amidala when to move, when to stop is key here. And unlike games such as Resident Evil 4 where you can put Ashley in a bin for both safety and your own weird fetishism, Amidala can get snuck up on by rogue droids. There's a random element that will keep you on your toes. Thankfully, she's more badass than Jar Jar, so she can take more hits. She even lets you know about her health. She keeps saying she just has a shoulder graze or that she can't take another hit. This is a level you're going to have to do multiple times with multiple save slots because you really need to know what's coming, what to do, and when to do it. And when you mess up, and yes, you will mess up, the level is long enough that you won't want to do it all again. I mean, the first time I pretty much shit the bed when six roller droids rocked up to spoil the party, I can barely kill one of them, never mind a full platoon. The second time, however, I was a bit more ready. I've learned from my mistakes. I know where she's going to get absolutely mullered. I know where droids are going to cheese it, so I can double cheese them in advance, or whatever the term is. Let's do it again. This time, we're going up the side stairs, sneaking past the droids. We're not going to kill them just yet. Pick up a bloody rocket launcher, oh yeah. And this time, there's only two roller droids, which, while still taking the absolute piss to kill, I do manage it as we move on to the next area with yet another locked door. I love this bit. You have to go through a woman's house who will give you a bit of advice in how to get to the next part. But if you dare, if you so dare as to suggest maybe, just maybe lock her door during a planetary-wide invasion, she gets angry, tells you to mind your own business, then droids burst through the door and blast her to bits. That, that's glorious. Seriously, if you don't select that, no droids will come. But if you let her snap at you, she gets blasted. I can imagine the developer had a bad day that day. Maybe some miserable Karen gave him an earful and to vent his frustration, he made this. And this game is just full of bizarre people and weird interactions. There's definitely an unmistakable air of surrealism. I was surprised to find out that this was not developed by a British studio because honestly, it feels like it is. Or maybe they literally had no idea or just didn't care what to include since probably no one would check it out anyways, because who's got time to check out one of the probably a billion licensed tie-ins for this movie? The game's too hard for the suits to get through anyways. They didn't play it. Like this fisherman guy, he serves no purpose as far as I know. It, it's hard to tell sometimes because quite often you only get one chance at selecting dialogue for something interesting to happen. If you say the wrong thing at the wrong time, that's it. It is what it is. You missed it. But here, he's just he's just here complaining that all the explosions are scaring away the fish. What? It's just a weird interaction with every sentence ushered. Bother me here. Isn't there a vast deadly waterfall at the end of this river? What sort of question is that? Why don't you jump in and find out? I sense a great disturbance in the force. I must leave. What is this? And this awkwardness adds quite a lot to the charm of the game. It's almost parody levels and I quite love it. And this level does not let up. And the last part of the level is just as hard, if not harder, since by this point, Amidala has probably taken a bit of a beating. There's one last run to the hangar, but if you kill this guard here, a roller droid and a whole platoon will sneak up behind Amidala. I highly advise you cheese save with this one. I had to try multiple different ways. Shooting from afar? No. Gung hoing it? Nope. Instead, I decided not to bother with this dude just yet, instead going ahead alone. Clear it all out and then head back. And for some reason, that worked. Insta save. Once you're past the blockade, your ship is severely damaged, which means that you have to land on a planet very underutilized by the Star Wars franchise, 
Tatooine. Never heard of that before. But first, can we address the total lack of respect for Star Wars' greatest hero, R2-D2, whose first contribution to the shaping of the entire galaxy is completely overlooked in this cutscene. They don't care about him. So we land on Tatooine, and now we finally take control of slacker guy himself, Qui-Gon Jinn, with Jar Jar and Padme heading into Mos Espa. No, this is not Mos Eisley, as I thought as a kid. You'll have a little bit of an action-y part as you defeat some Tuscan Raiders, who I have to admit are my favourite Italian football team. This isn't in the movie, but I see why they added it, since this is the part where, you know, Kids will get a little bit restless watching it. Not much happens here in the movie, and it's not easy to make a proper game out of it. But I will give this release credit, they did try. They made it into perhaps by far and away the most memorable part of the game. Seriously, this is the place I remember the most, probably because I couldn't use action replay to get past it. I got stuck here, so I was here forever. I was 10, so that kind of thing really sticks in the memory. The main goal is to repair the ship. Instead of just hiring transport and getting off quickly, you want to repair a hyperdrive generator. And boy does this town know it. I'm looking for a T-14 hyperdrive generator. 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 Yes, this is where the game pretty much offers a very different experience. What was hinted at in the Gungan City is now fully blown here. While there are action parts, this is definitely an adventure game now. You have to explore this town, talk to people, find clues, and take part in the most ridiculous of trading quests. More memorable than the Soap Lady in Suikoden and the one in Link's Awakening, this is utterly gloriously baffling. This place is pretty big, especially for a non-linear level, and even after you've been wandering around for an hour and know exactly what you need to do, you will be begging for a map. Maps are useful in some games. When levels are linear, like most of the ones in this game, they're not necessary, but here, this is a city you're walking around, and you can't look forward, so it's hard to like know where you're going. A map would have been useful. As you talk to some of the vendors around here and ask them about the T-14 hyperdrive generator, you'll hear the names Watto and then Anakin. Yeah, in the movie, they rock straight up to Watto and meet Anakin, but here, you need to find the boy Anakin first, who will then introduce you to Watto. And you need to figure out this just by talking to people. They will tell you where to find Anakin, who won't appear in the slave quarters until you actually know he's supposed to be there. I just heard the screams of a thousand speedrunners crying out in pain and suddenly silenced. I'm joking, they've already completed this game in 40 minutes. It took me 8 hours. This is a strange place. To liven up this slightly more peaceful moment, they went all Moss Eisley Cantina here and made loads of people happy to square up to you on the streets. They push you, which hurts you. Yes, if you get pushed enough, this Jedi Master will die. You can cut these buggers down with no consequence if you want to. You may even have mugging attempts on you. Now if you remember, Obi-Wan once said of Mos Eisley, You will never find the more wretched hive of scum and villainy. It's obvious he stayed on the bloody ship here, otherwise he'd have said, You will never find the more wretched hive of scum and villainy. Aside from Mos Espa. This place is worse than Sheffield City Centre on a Friday night. I'm starting to think that the Empire isn't so bad after all. I've suddenly become a fascist thanks to this game. Seriously, this part of the game is where you can pretty much go full GTA with not a whole lot of consequence. Although, if you decide to gun down these Jawas, you'll be hunted by everyone and they'll call you a murderer, which, you know, is fair enough. They shot me first though. You'll need to explore pretty much all of the buildings here, find some weird stuff. I do like how there's a pod racer repair shop and stuff like that. That really enhances the world building. You can even pop in here and see a rather awkward scene with an elephant and two hookers. They'll scream at you to get out, although, you know, maybe learn from this mouthy lady's mistake and lock your friggin' doors. Both of them. You'll meet up with Anakin after you've talked with enough people, at least until Shmi blackmails Qui-Gon into taking the boy away. Now you've met Anakin, he'll take you to see Watto. You have to make your way through a literal dump, avoiding mechanical crunches, platforming. It's actually another clever way to introduce more action elements in what should be a really subdued level. Once you've gotten to Watto, it's time to begin the most head-scratching trading sequence ever created. Mainly because I'm entirely sure there's not an actual proper sequence. 
Watto won't take your credits, but is willing to put a wager on a pod race. But you're going to need some real moolah before you can even do that. Thankfully, Master Qui-Gon can cleverly take advantage of Anakin using his racing skills to hopefully win the bet. But yeah, you still need money for the wager. So, two points. First, you need to fix Anakin's pod racer. There's a handful of parts you need. Plus, one of the two Twi'lek hookers offers to introduce you to Jabba the Hutt, who will give you the betting money. But that's for a future level to worry about. So, first, let's fix that pod racer. What sets this apart is that there are different ways to go about it. Different trading sequences can occur depending on who you talk to first, what you can offer them and even what you say to them. For example, the first time I tried this, I traded something with Watto immediately. I bargained for two fuel thingies, which he went for. But then I tried again after I reloaded a save, and he basically told me to piss off and wouldn't trade anything with me. How peculiar is that? You'll need to find some stuff yourself, like rescuing a boy who's imprisoned, his mother will gift you a part that you can trade for, and if you're well and truly lost like I was, well then you should head back to the Jawas in this dump. If you follow them instead of Anakin, you'll find a trading part there. After you've murdered them, of course. You'll also come across the cheesiest salesman ever. Better stand back, mister, because I'm about to slash all my prices. And you need to listen to this every single time you want to talk with him, which you'll be doing a fair bit if your trading sequence has fried your brain. This is by far and away going to be the longest level in the game for most of you out there, unless you follow a guide, which I really don't recommend. I don't want to be one of those gatekeeper people, but really, you should discover stuff for yourself here. I wouldn't blame you for having to have a little bit of peek for this level, although I can't imagine like the guide making a whole lot of sense either. I can imagine the guide writer having the equation meme going through their head, you know, trying to write this. Did you do it? Well, now it is time to race, but still we've got to pad out that run time. So we have a scene just before the race begins, because you still haven't got your betting money from Jabba, like the Twi'lek promised. I actually quite like this level because there's even more world building adding to the movie. Plus there's some bonus stuff, such as this random sand crawler, which has been taken over by my favorite Italian football team. You're kind of tricked with this Jabba meeting since you fall through a false floor into a deathly spike pit, which Jabba then goes on and on through unstoppable dialogue until you agree or are forced to fight this big worms champion warrior to the death. Now, I don't know about you, but where I'm from, if you need to scrounge some betting money, you either need to sell your kids, exchange a few cigarettes, or just a quick blowy, you know? Fight to the death will do. This is a really, really tough fight. I hope you picked up extra weapons from the previous level since this guy may rip you to shreds. Honestly, I had to fight this guy about five times before I won, and the most painful thing was having to go through Jabba's interaction each time before the fight. I could have saved after the speech, but I didn't want to lock myself into the fight. I found the best way to cheese this mother was to keep him trapped in the spikes for long enough to sap his health, at least a little bit before he started to brutalize me. Yes, you'll know I've cheesed this game quite a lot, it is true. But this game is really hard, it is. Its difficulty balance is so out of whack. And the lack of any reasonable checkpoints, I mean there's zero checkpoints, makes me not care so much if I cheese it. If the game is going to do its best to mess me over, I'll take any advantage I can get. I'm not technically cheating, this is all within the rules and laws of this game's physics. I'm not using a cheat code, I'm just cheesing. And if you want to play this, you should too. Cheese this mother, especially this boss. Now I'm not saying like save after every jump or every battle, but you know, just be reasonable with it. With that out of the way, you can finally give your money to Watto, but only if you buy this dude and his companion a drink. I don't know why they felt the need to add that extra three minutes to the game, but hey, buying some booze, new gameplay mechanic. You won't use it again. Now you've made the bet, you have to head to the grid to talk to Anakin, not before. Look out, more padding. Something from his racer is stolen. This snidey little shit. I spent at least 15 minutes wandering around aimlessly looking for him after he disappeared, which is super annoying when you've got this huge wide open space but you can't see anything but your own toenails. Honestly, this annoyed me beyond belief. Up until I almost decided to give up and start to head back to Watto just in case I missed something. And oh no, oh, he's there, he's there. He's pissed off in a house. That little rat bag says he's nothing to do with it, so go in further to find a second boss. Now, I'm standing here. He's doing nothing. There's obviously a fight about to happen. Better start lobbing grenades. You'll have to go to me if you want it. <laughs> Ah! 
Sometimes cheesing feels better than sex. Huzzah! After a rather anticlimactic race, you win. Not only did you win your hyperdrive, but you also get to take part in child trafficking. What a haul. The next level is the shortest level of the lot. Basically, the only real action that happens in the movie, aside from the pod racing, the Dorthiest Morliest of the Sith decide to test your might. As your companions are retreating to their ship, you have to distract them in a small area. But first, take out these mega annoying blaster droids first. I don't think you can actually beat him here, but running around like an Egypt really did the trick. After he jumped up and stuck to a wall like Spider-Man, the game appeared to think that he glitched out and we got to escape. I'll take the glitch. One level, done in a single paragraph. I bet you wish I could be that efficient with all the levels. I mean, there's genuinely nothing all that interesting going on, but hey, this is bleeding into a second paragraph, so let's move on. You've arrived on Coruscant. We're on level 9, three levels left, and we're now getting our hands on with a non-Jedi character. Yes, instead of having progression, getting more powerful as we go on, we actually now have to play as a lowly bodyguard, Captain Panaka, who, by the way, according to Star Wars lore, becomes a moth in the service of the Emperor Palpatine. Shall I jump off the platform now, or wait a bit first? Probably wait a bit, since it's another escort mission of sorts. This is something that's been completely pulled out of the arse of the developers, because in the movie, this is where they just sit in a room and talk. It's boring as shit, although you have to admit, Ian McDermott is just utterly fantastic in every movie he's in. What a guy. Anyways, before they get to that room, on the way there, according to this game, Amidala and her guards are ambushed by mercenaries, and only Panaka can protect her and escort her via an alternative route through a tour guide. Apparently it stops off at the Senate. Could call a taxi, but hey, that would be just as boring as the movie part. So yeah, this level is kind of in two parts. The first part is trying to get tickets for the tour. <laughs> that sounds stupid, but it is part of the level. Apparently even the queen needs to cough up the dough for them, but she's skint at the minute, so Panaka needs to do a bit of trading. Outside, there's a couple of people you can engage with to make a super pointless trade between the two of them. You pawn your binoculars to Dana Scully over here for cash. You give the cash to the other dude who gives you tickets. It's superfluous in terms of gameplay design, and I don't even know why they bothered. At least have them in different areas and, you know, have more people to interact with so you have to guess who the real people are. It's like they added, like, the essential important bit for the level, but forgot to fill it out. But I do give the game credit for, once again, giving a different experience to different people. For example, on my first time playing this, I accidentally thought Dana Scully was one of the mercenaries and I just blasted her instantly. Sorry, you know, Panaka, like I said, he's a bit of a grey character. He'd probably blast people just to get the job done. I was getting into the role. But yeah, Dana dropped the cash and I just picked it up and gave it to this dude over here for the tickets. The second time, I actually negotiated and did the light side route, so to speak. This game is good for giving different experiences to different people. Once you're through to the tour area, the shuttle zooms off and blows up and stuff. You're a bit too late and thank god, and you're ambushed by another drone. Let's just say Captain Panaka is more like prawn cracker. He's as weak as a freshly dunked milk biscuit. And that's what makes this level tough. It doesn't help that health pickups are few and far between. I mean, this captain is definitely not used to, like, a firefight on Naboo. He can't even do a dodge roll. Instead, he does this, like, granddad sidestep. What's that all about? But he does have one weapon up his sleeve. It's a literal weapon. A big, heavy blaster that also bounces off the walls. It's very useful for this level. Since you missed the boat, pretty much, then you'll see this box puzzle bit with two pushable crates, one of which is locked behind a force field. After bumbling around like Mr. Bean, pushing the box to the wrong place at the wrong time, I finally figured out where I needed to go. I got up, pressed this switch to make the force field go down. Now, I have two boxes at my disposal, but then I hear Queen Amidala screaming for help. Wonderful. She has been kidnapped. And I'm sat here thinking, what was the point of all that box pushing? Because I know I've edited this down, but it really took quite a long time to do. And unless I'm missing something, that puzzle was completely pointless. Basically to distract me from the queen so that she could get taken away. But seriously, I, I didn't even need to use the boxes at all. Unless this bit was just a glitchy broken mess, which I'm not discounting because of the glitchiest glitchy of levels, this one takes the biscuit. Usually in games you have to try to find glitches such as these, but genuinely I wasn't even trying. I had so little belief in this level to keep it together, I pretty much knew what would work and what wouldn't work. 
No, seriously, I just jumped over a locked door, and this door to the boss pushed me up high. I'll get into that in a second. After taking down more mercs, you have to side sneak into this building and down into the restricted area, which is basically where the hobos live, and apparently the game feels it's fine to just murder them. Which you really do need to do, they just say you're mean and start beating on you like they need money for the next hit. Once you've busted the queen out, you'll get to another puzzle room, which isn't particularly logical, but if you fiddle around enough, you'll succeed. Which is basically my entire approach to video editing, although success is questionable. You'll then get to this boss who I swear to god is impossible unless you bring out the full stinking bishop. Which is a type of cheese, not what Dali thinks, that AI needs some reprogramming. I mentioned this before, this level is kind of broken, even if you don't try. I had so little confidence in this level, I just knew that if I stood here when the doors closed up, it would push me up to a higher plane, and it did. And even then, it took absolutely ages to kill this bastard. He's a mental case. If you get by this boss without being a knob yourself, then full respect to you. Now, maybe there's a rocket launcher I missed, or grenades, or something like that, but I don't think secret stuff should be essential for clearing a level. Maybe that's just me. Once we get to Palpatine, we're told that the Senate will do bugger all to help. A nice waste of time for everyone involved, I think we can all agree. So instead of having a lot of resource intensive cutscenes, we just get this comical title scroll, basically saying, sorry, you'd be bored shitless if we explain this via cutscenes. So now, you're back on Naboo. You're gonna do this yourself. You've got yourself a plan to kidnap the leader of the Trade Federation, make him surrender. Here is the first time you'll be doing some role swapping, and it's also the first time you'll be taking control of Queen Amidala herself. And what is she equipped with? A stun gun. Yes, the further we get in this game, the weaker we get. Actually, we start off as Obi-Wan, but as soon as you step into the hangar, you meet up with Darth Maul and it switches over to Padme, as she heads to the throne room. This time, it's basically a reverse escort mission, as you need to make sure the prawn cracker himself is safely through to the throne room. Why the other guards can die, but he can't, is a mystery. He doesn't really do much else in this movie. Thankfully, he is juiced up a bit since we played him, and he's pretty badass. He actually helps out quite a lot. This level will be familiar to you as it's basically the escape from Theed in reverse, which I think is a fun design choice. It's giving you something familiar and twisting it ever so slightly. Time has passed since you were last here. You should know the route, which makes you feel like you have the upper hand. This is your hood. You know where to go, where the little secrets are, and there's also that intrigue as to seeing what has changed. I like revisiting areas in games as it's a clever way for developers to reuse assets but also making it compelling at the same time. Obviously that can go horribly wrong if handled in the wrong way or if the developers get complacent and use it too much, but this one time in this game with ever so slight changes and differences it might actually be one of my favourite levels. Firstly Padme gets a rocket launcher. Wow. She's instantly gone up in my books. She's like a top tier Star Wars character now. Ho oh, ho. The best touch for me is this droid here because this astromech appears the first time you're in this level. If he's destroyed, then he won't appear in this later level. But if he's still alive, he will help you out by opening the blast door for you, which is much less hassle than having to trek back. Again, a nice little touch that may give different players a different experience. Seriously though, Padme is really badass. She's using turrets to take down waves of enemies. This is the most action we've seen in this game so far. Usually we're cheesing levels, taking pot shots. Padme, she's just going full Rambo. You'll intermittently switch between Padme and Obi-Wan who's sparring with Darth Maul alongside Qui-Gon. This is so uninteresting, it is painful. It's just random flailing of lightsabers with no rhyme or reason as to if the attacks connect or not. Thankfully, it doesn't last long and you'll be back with Padme soon enough. I never thought I'd be thankful, but I am. The next level is also very similar, so much so I'm not sure why they didn't just consider it to be the same level since they pick up immediately after one another. Obi-Wan is separated from Qui-Gon once again, shock horror, but Qui-Gon is doing some of the work. Although if by work you mean absent-mindedly flailing his light sword and doing nothing, while Obi-Wan takes on treacherous platforming puzzle sections then, sure, yes. This is perhaps the most frustrating platforming the game has to offer. Right here, this room. I failed my jump so many times. It had the potential to be a really interesting level, but the near verticality nature of your jumps make it a way harder time than it needs to be. Also, 
Nothing says climactic ending like waiting for elevators time after time. Eventually, after a fun infiltration of the palace with Padme, taking down droids, finding key cards to open doors, even going on window ledges, you'll soon be in the throne room and making the Trade Federation surrender. It's now time for the final battle. Die, Jedi, die. No! Qui-Gon is struck by Maul and downed. Now it's only you versus him. And I've only got a bit of health left, so I am shitting myself right now. Run, 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 run. I knew, I just knew there'd be a secret health around here somewhere. But still, I know it's not going to be a pushover regardless, so uh, it's a final battle. And usually, you should bring everything you've learned thus far to the fold to defeat the great enemy. It's what all games do. So, what has this game taught me? Lightsabers are bobbins, blow that mother up. Yeah, I'm not sure this is working, but fuck it. It's the end of the game, and I'm not going to need them anyways. After a bit of extra slapsies, it is over. One of the few bosses I beat on the first try. Thank you very much, Rocket Launcher. Congratulations, you have just saved the galaxy. What do you mean the 27 movies left? Well, at least Darth Maul's dead. What do you mean? Well... At least Anakin's safe, he's off to be trained as a Jedi, and with him around, there'll be no trouble whatsoever in the galaxy. Star Wars Episode 1 The Phantom Menace is an incredibly flawed game. It's incredibly imbalanced with many of its systems, and it was obviously rushed out of the door in time for release to catch the hype. An interesting fact is that the PC version of the game came out a day before the movie. Before the movie, you could be spoiled by the video game. I mean, you need to be pretty hardcore, but if you got this on PC, you could spoil the ending for everyone before they'd even gone to the cinema. And that's a weird thing that would never happen today, but it did happen before, like with the first Harry Potter movie, at least for the American release. Lord of the Rings Two Towers, the game tie-in, came out two months before the film's release. Yeah, you got to experience Helm's Deep before the movie showed you. Sure, it's based off a book, but this visualization of the book is what you would be paying for in the movie. What a time! Maybe we'll get to that game at some point too, that was great. You know what, I know people like to shit on this game and hate it, and yeah, it, it has its bad, bad moments, but I do think it did a good job in transcribing the movie into a full game. It helped fill in the blanks that the movie had to cut out because, let's face it, not everyone wanted to see a massive 40 minute intro where you see the two Jedi escape from the Trade Federation and then make their way through a swamp. In the movie, it just happens. But this, it enhances it. It's not without its merits. And it had an impact on me as a kid. Even though I barely remember playing this, it managed to brand its certain something onto me that stuck with me for over 20 years. The fact that you could choose text dialogue in a console game that wasn't a dedicated adventure game. The fact that you could play different styles that had different consequences from time to time. The fact that it filled out a movie and genuinely added layers to it. I mean, canonically, if I ever watch the movie again, these filler levels, they will be in my head when it gets to each point of the movie. Let's face it, we all want to fantasize about Jar Jar swagging up to a hail of lasers. Not everyone who plays this will have the exact same experience. It's a linear game by all means, but depending on your choices and even some random elements, it will give different people slightly different outcomes. And that is genuinely commendable. I can imagine talking with my school friends, if I had any, about what I did and being amazed that something different may have happened to them. It encourages replayability if you can stomach some of the more unbalanced segments. And I can't for the love of me imagine how and why they decided on this particular camera angle. That combined with the non-thought out difficulty, it's a game that's way worse than it deserves to be. Because there's a lot gone into this that I genuinely like. It's not a good game but it's one of my favorite Star Wars games. The production value gone into this is surprisingly good, especially for the time. Well, less so the coding, but around the janky gameplay, the voice acting is quite good, despite them being obvious knockoffs of famous people. I joke about Qui-Gon talking from the side of his mouth, but it's fine. And they did manage to get three of the real voice actors into record lines for this game. Anakin is voiced by Jake Lloyd because, you know, kids are cheap. Watto and Jar Jar is well, it's not often you get to play racist stereotypes, so you gotta take those opportunities while you can. 
The music and general sound design is phenomenal, which can't have been too difficult considering they were working with the Star Wars movies. When you've got John Williams' score to play with for your game, it's very difficult to mess up the audio. The sound effects are on point too if they didn't glitch out from time to time. The blast sounds, the ships moving, everything is perfectly Star Wars. This ain't no dollar store space battle knockoff, it's a genuine LucasArts product. The game also has its own CG cutscenes which I'm sure you noticed. They're pretty much exact copies of the movie scenes but instead of being squished down FMBs, they're made from scratch. Rather than being an artistic choice, I'm guessing they needed to finish the game in time for PC release and only had access to early versions of the movie scenes, perhaps even just storyboards. But still, it's pretty cool seeing them like this. Star Wars has more game tie-ins than maybe any other franchise out there and this ranks probably somewhere in the middle lower half if people listed them all and I totally understand that but you know what I had enough fun with it for this video it's pretty unique and I wouldn't wholeheartedly recommend playing it of course I mean don't play it <laughs> why would you do that just watch this video it's probably enough for you but you know I hope I help shed some light on this game that is not great but it does have some very unique and charming moments now before we go, you may remember I briefly joked about a stinking bishop and due to the Twitter craze at the time of playing this, I was randomly trying in some uh, you know AI generated pictures for my experience with this game and if you don't mind, I'd like to share just a handful of them with you. Let's just get the dumb one out of the way first. Here's Queen Amidala eating a banana. I just got in on a rhythm thing thanks to uh, Captain Panaka eating a prawn cracker. And one of the big themes of this game was Qui-Gon being separated from you so what was he doing? Here's Qui-Gon chilling out while you make your way through Thede's garden. Here he is pissing about with some fish while you're breaking Jar Jar out of jail. And here he is rolling up a cigarette while you're escorting Amidala. Can't forget about Darth Maul. Apparently he's not dead. So what did he do after he got chopped in half? Chill out on a beach with a cocktail? Gotta have some recovery time. And there we have it. Did you play this back in the day? I would love to know your thoughts on it. Is it terrible or do you think it does have some like a uh, small nuances of joy? I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm pretty tired. This is like an hour long. Anyways, I kind of like it even though it's rubbish. Uh, also, what is your favorite Star Wars game? I would love to know. Mine is Knights of the Old Republic or maybe Rogue Squadron. So difficult to choose. In terms of what's next, well, that's up to the Patreon producers. Yes, I have a list of games I want to cover in my head, but just before this video went up, I put up a poll asking for some Patreons to vote which game is next. So look forward to the results of that. Remember, this episode's bonus content is Obi-Wan Adventures on the Game Boy Color. It's basically this game, but on the Game Boy Color and less of the massacres going on. Yeah, unfortunately you can't go apeshit on this one, but it may be worth a random look. I don't know why I chose this one, but you can watch it over on Patreon, maybe right now or in the next couple of days. We'll see about that. It will be public at a later date, I promise. It's just a quick early bonus for our Patreon members. Thanks to all who watched the video, I really appreciate it. If you watched all the way through, the longer you watch, the more YouTube is likely to share this video around, thinking, ooh, this video must be good. This guy watched a long time, I'm going to let other people know about it. So yeah, if you watched all the way through, you're a massive legend, and I can't thank you enough alongside our Patreon. So... Why do I keep saying our? It's mine. It's all mine now. Anyways, if you did watch all the way through, uh, what can you give me? Is there a prawn cracker emoji? There must be. There has to be a prawn cracker emoji. There's gotta be. I would massively appreciate it if you like and subscribe and spread the video around to people who may enjoy it. It would be cool to have more people watch. And also a very special thanks to my Patreon supporters. Here you are, here you are. I don't have too many of them just yet. I'm hoping it will grow bigger. And a special big up thank you to LS4, one of my super producers. Yes, thank you ever so much for your really generous support. And all of you, really thank you ever so much. I really hope I can do these videos full time at some point. And if you want me to, then maybe head over to there to give just a little bit to your man Jordan. Thank you ever so much.